Robin here, back again with the second part of my series on the amazing new Motion VFX plugin MO2 that brings you professional grade 3D directly inside Final Cut Pro 10 and Motion. After getting you up and running with the basics in the first part, I want to, of course, dig much deeper with the next episodes covering materials, animation, and much more. And for any and all infos above and beyond this series, be sure to check out the description. So let's get started. So in the first part, I showed you how to identify content within the scene of a pre-made template that was designed to be replaced. In this episode, we want to look at the overall different types of content and how to identify them. This is helpful if, for example, you want to dissect an existing template or project to learn a little more about how things are done, or just want to find and customize certain elements to your liking. As a nice example, I've put the Logo 05 template into my timeline, since it has pretty much every type of object and content in it that the scene can actually have. The scene structure is displayed in the Titles Inspector as a hierarchical tree, very much like in motion and contains the entire content of the current 3D scene. So all models, lights, cameras, etc. are going to be listed here, and again, all have unique icons so I can identify what it is I'm looking for very quickly and easily. Any scene element can be dragged up or down to another position, or even onto another element to group them together. Nulls, on the other hand, work pretty much like motions groups, so you can drop many different things inside one and control them as a whole. These are represented in the list by this three-axis icon. Twirling open the arrow on the left reveals its content. And also, just as in motion, option clicking any of the disclosure triangles opens and closes any and all groups or nulls within that group. Here, for example, we have a single camera group with just one camera in it. Below that, we have a custom logo group that, if we troll it open, we see contains an SVG or logo element, as we already saw in the first episode, as well as a so-called instancer. The SVG object is conveniently represented by an SVG icon. Flipping this open reveals the individual face, bevel, and body elements into which the SVG model is in fact split when imported. This, of course, allowing for applying materials to each individually, for example, and are also represented by unique icons. By the way, as I mentioned in the first part of this series, if you don't have an actual SVG of the logo or object that you want to include in your scene, but you do have a JPEG or maybe a PNG of that logo, then head over to png to svg.com, upload it there, and it'll actually generate an SVG file from it, which you can then, of course, use in MO2 as well. Obviously, the higher the resolution of your image, the better the results will be. And from experience, I can tell you that it will generally work great and gives you a lot of options. Okay, now flipping open the instancer below that reveals a long list of other objects. Whereby an instancer can have one of four different icons, depending on which of the four different types that are available it in fact is. Selecting it and scrolling down to the instancer settings, we see a pop-up menu for its distribution type, currently set to linear. If we click on it and set it to any of the other three options, we see how its icon changes accordingly. So just by looking at it in the list of scene content, we can tell whether it is a linear grid radial or even an object instancer. I'll be covering exactly what instancers even are and how to create, use, and edit them in a later episode in much more detail. Twirling open the instancer, we see a modifier, which also has three different types with respective icons. Switching any of these on and off with their check marks also gives us a quick idea of which objects they're affecting. Even further down, we see various primitives, such as tubes and toruses, which all have an icon behind them which represents the material that they have been assigned. Finishing off the list, we have several lights and even more instancers and modifiers. Lights, too, can of course be selected, after which their type can be changed into any one of four types of lights in the light settings that appear below. Sphere, Spot, Directional, and Ambient. If I wanted to clean things up a bit, I could simply click the first light, 
Then scroll down and shift click the last object. Then you right click anywhere and choose group. With that, everything is placed in a new null called group, which I can double click and name miscellaneous, for example. If you want to add a model, that of course is super easy as well. At the bottom of the section, I see add with two pop-up menus next to it. The first one is for object and the second for materials. Clicking on the first one gives me a menu where I can select from six different types of objects, anything from a model to a camera. But I can also get the same menu by clicking anywhere outside of the scene content list only with one additional option for clearing the entire scene, which would delete everything from my list. Under Add Object and Model, I get all of the standard model categories and have even more flyout menus. Mousing over any given model in any of these categories even gives me a small preview of the model I'm about to select, which I think is a pretty brilliant touch. But if I find this too difficult to navigate, I can always simply choose From Library at the very top. With that, the Model Library browser window opens with the entire very large and diverse model library, divided into the various categories on the left. Selecting any of the categories shows me its contents on the right. Selecting a model even loads its vertice texture, meshes, and light count information at the bottom. Each model also has a small star icon at the top right. Clicking it turns the star blue, marking it as a favorite, after which I have quick access to it in the favorites category on the left. This, by the way, is also where you have to come to add external models that you might have or maybe even downloaded from the internet. And if you don't have anything, and maybe you want something to play around with, or just need 3D models in general, I can definitely recommend sites like sketchfab.com for both superb free as well as commercial content, or free3d.com for a bunch of free content, as the name already suggests. The file formats that MO2 supports for import are OBJ, Filmbox, Collada, 3DS, Lightwave, as well as Cinema 4D project files. Retaining animation, textures, and everything else, assuming that they were done right. I'll just click Import and navigate to a folder of some simple models that I downloaded. Here's a little drone model I downloaded from Free3D, where we can see I have one of three Lightwave formats or an OBJ to choose from. While most of the content on Free3D is free, hence the name, duh, the brilliant thing about Sketchfab, on the other hand, is it's that they offer all their models as GLTF, also known as GL Transmission Format, as the standard export format for all downloadable models, in addition to the original file format that it was uploaded as. GLTF is a one-size-fits-all file format designed to let you move 3D files seamlessly between applications while retaining a consistent physically-based rendering, aka PBR, workflow. A format that MO2 is, of course, also able to import, which I can see if I look into this Lantern folder, for example. With the GLTF format, you consistently get exactly what you see on the side as a preview in MO2 without the hassle of disconnected textures or the likes, since it contains everything. Geometry, materials, textures, animation, everything. Something that most other formats can't guarantee. I'll simply select it and click Choose. The window closes, and I'm presented with the Import Model dialog window. At the top, I can rename it to Lantern. And in the menu below that, I can select to save it into any existing library category, or select the first menu point to create my own category. I'll do that and just call it Rob's. Below that, I have the default size of the model measured in meters. It's a good idea to make sure that its virtual size is actually roughly what it could be in the real world, since model and scene scale is especially important when it comes to things like depth of field and ambient occlusion, etc. Models whose relative size is way too small or way too big can end up looking unnatural in the final render. Changing any one of these values also changes the relative value of the other two. I'll just change its height to a full one meter, 
and we see the other two values are adjusted accordingly. But even if it does come in wrong, I can obviously always change it later as well. This just saves me a step. Last but not least, I have to choose my material workflow. Clicking on the pop-up menu shows me the three different kinds of texture workflows I can choose from. The most common workflows are metal roughness and specular glossiness. The last so-called legacy material workflow will generally be used for projects coming from other 3D applications such as Maya or Cinema 4D, through which MO2 will attempt to convert them to a usable metalness roughness workflow. In which case it should be noted that materials converted from legacy or specular glossiness may in fact differ from how they look in other renderers that support them natively. And, well, since I read in the model description on the Sketchfab site, where I downloaded this from, that this model uses the metalness and roughness material channels, something you'll always want to look for, by the way, that's what I'll choose. If you want more details about the various options and in-depth ex explanations, what to look for and when to use what, I highly recommend clicking the little information icon at the top right. This will take you to the MO2 manual, which has a level of comprehensiveness that you won't see from any other plugin maker other than MotionBFX. You'll see this button scattered all over the interface as well, so keep a lookout. Now all I have to do is hit OK, and I'm taken back to the model library and my new category where I can see and select my newly imported model. If I've imported several models, I can even select several at once by holding either the Command or Shift key. But since adding a lantern of all things to a scene such as this would be kind of silly, I think I'll go into the motion graphics and stages subcategory, select the metal neon stage model, and simply click add to add it to my scene. After a brief loading period, I can see the model has been added to my scene and is clearly much too large. And to reduce the need for scrolling, I'll simply drag it from the bottom of the list up under my logo object. Now I simply need to go to its basic parameters where I can click and drag behind the global scale parameter to resize it to my liking. Now all I have to do is use the 3D gizmo to position it under my logo. Revealing the contents of the middle neon stage object shows me it consists of four main elements. Selecting the chandelier object highlights it in the viewer and I can see it's covering my logo. But since I don't want to change the overall position of the stage below it, I can either simply hide it by clicking its check mark, or even just right click it and select delete. With that, it disappears from my scene and I have an unobstructed view of my logo. Scrubbing through the project shows me that it's also been perfectly integrated, animation and all. And just to show you how incredibly easy it is to even add some text and animate it, I'll simply right click outside of my scene content list again, select add object, 3D text slash SVG, and 3D text. That gives me a new 3D text layer at the bottom of my list and I see the default text object in my scene reading MO2. With it selected, just as we saw in the first episode, if I scroll down to the selection-based area of the parameters, I can enter is amazing into the text field. I can, of course, select a font, font style, change the tracking and spacing, and all the usual parameters. The only thing I don't have is a classic font point size menu. Instead, I would simply use the scale parameter under the basics. After all that, I could save everything as my own style by clicking the Save Style button at the bottom. And as with the models, I get a window where I can name the style and select the category to put it in or create my own. But I'll close this with the little X at the top left, which gets me into the main window of the Styles library. Here I can select any of the great pre-installed style designs and apply it to my text. Simply selecting it already gives me a preview of it in context in my viewer. I'll go with something nice and flashy like this neon style and click OK. Now I'll use the 3D gizmo again to position the text a little further in the front. And for animating text, MotionVFX has come up with a super simple concept, which is effectively 
the same as motion's own behaviors, namely text behaviors, which I find further down in the list in my inspector hiding behind this blue button. Here, once again, I find a huge selection of pre-made text animations divided into animation in and animation out animations. Ooh, that was a lot of animations. These two can be favorited with a little star at the top right of each preview. Hovering my mouse over each one also gives me a preview of the animation. I'll simply select the second animation in animation, ascent in, and click OK. That applies the animation to the very beginning of my template, which is of course way too early. Changing the in point of the animation is super easy. All I have to do is skim to the frame where I want it to begin. I'll go with somewhere around 713. And now click the start from current frame button under the text behaviors button. And if I skim through the timeline, I can see now it does exactly that. And if I wanted the animation to run faster or slower, I could do that by adjusting the end frame of the animation by clicking the end at current frame button at the frame I would like it to end. And there you go. We've created an elaborate scene with a custom logo, custom text, and a custom model within just a few minutes. Minus uh, all the chatter, that is. <laughs> Now all I have to do is hit Control R to render everything within a few seconds to view it in full quality and real time. So, so much for part two. What do you think so far? Are you as excited about discovering all the new possibilities that MO2 can offer you and your productions as I am? Let us know in the comments. Coming up in the next few episodes, we'll look at the scene settings, how to navigate the viewer, setting lights, materials, animation, and more. If you want to be sure not to miss any of the new episodes, subscribe and hit that little bell to be notified once they go live. As always, any and all relevant infos and links down below in the description. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next videos. This is Robin signing off. Until the next time.